Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second staging of our Port Royal Lecture Series. I am Donique Smith, your moderator for this afternoon. Now, having an excellent first lecture, we thought, how are we ever going to top it? Our first lecture we had was under the theme, The Blue Economy, Regeneration and Resilience. And if you were in the room or you were watching online, you know that it was a very robust discussion. And I promise you that today we'll have a similar or even more exciting discussion. So this evening we're discussing the role of smart shipping. We are talking about smart shipping and gender balance and how that impacts marine environmental protection. So why is this particular topic important? Well, we know the role that we play in protecting our marine ecospaces and how they contribute to mitigating climate change. One of the ways that we're gonna do that is through smart shipping. And we know that smart shipping is maximizing vessels um, efficiency through technology, which we'll, di we'll dive into that later. We'll also look at another critical component of this topic, which is gender balance. And by that we mean the opportunities for men and women to kind of come together and have an active role in whatever we are doing. And this afternoon we're looking at the marine space. So this is also important for CMU. Why? We are big on technology here at CMU. Our mission statement reads, redefining maritime excellence through education, research, and innovation. And we here at CMU, we are very equipped with the right tools, with the right people, to be the catalyst for change. And on that note, I want to say that you are welcome to join our tour at the end of this session. You will be touring our beautiful campus and seeing all of the technology that we boast about. We also believe that people, the right people should be in the right spaces. And so on our panel today, we believe that we have the right people to talk about gender balance, to talk about smart shipping, and to talk about how that integrates into what we're discussing today. So our panel for today, we have Dr. Yvette Smith-Johnson. She is CMU's Director of Graduate Studies and Research. We also have Dr. Dela Bean, who is a senior lecturer and graduate coordinator at the Institute for Gender and Development at the University of the West Indies. And we have Dr. Raquel Wright, who is a biotechnologist here at CMU. So once again, welcome. I hope you enjoy the discussion that we're gonna have today. I hope that you participate and come with your questions because we have some very important people in the room who can answer those questions. All right? So are we ready to get started? The room sounds a bit quiet. Are we ready to get started? Yes. All right. I think, I think in the room might need the online audience because they have the energy. I just feel it through the camera that they have the energy and they are going to be in the chat live and direct. So at this time, I want to bring to this stage our president, Professor Andrew Spencer, and he will be doing our welcome this afternoon. Thank you very much, moderator. Uh, I, I recall our graduation and the excitement of the guest speaker when he entered the stage. And for those who were there, I'm tempted to enter the stage in the same way, but I'd probably lose all decorum. He literally entered pumping his fist. Let's go! But I can sense that there's that kind of palpable excitement for the second in the series dubbed Poor Royal Lecture. I have the distinguish, distinguished pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, of introducing our very special guest today. I want to start with our guest speaker, Monsieur Hervé Berville, panelists who were recognized earlier. Other invited guests, Monsieur Olivier Grionvart, Mr. Dwight Gardner, Ambassador Antigua and Barbuda, Mademoiselle Claire Monet, diplomatic advisor, Mr. Darius Joseph, legal officer and deputy registrar Antigua and Barbuda, Department of Marine Services, 
Madame Iliano Kahua, MP for French Citizens Living Overseas, second constituency. Monsieur Francois Lomer, the Director General of ENSM, French Maritime Academy. Monsieur Pierre Emmanuel Conga, Minister's Chief of Staff. Madame Leslie Valois, Parliamentary Attaché. And before I get to the other names, I think you should give me a round of applause. I, I made it. <laughs> Executive Committee Member of the Women's International Shipping and Trading Association, WISTA, UK. All VPs, senior management team, team CMU, students, online participants, a warm welcome to you. So I used up all of my five minutes on the pronunciation of the names. So I'm just gonna borrow one more minute to kind of do a little bit of context setting before I make way for the main course of why we're here today. So the Port Royal Lecture Series, I'm sure that's not what I'm supposed to see. Uh, no, okay, all right, we're waiting on that. So today we have with us a, a very exciting keynote, which I don't want to take too much time doing anything else because this keynote is going to be critical in, in shaping the rest of the discussion which is happening with our very exciting discussants and panelists. So very quickly, why are we here? Why are we talking about this? We had a discussion the last time about the blue economy and I think certainly there can be no more important time for, have, for us to have a discussion about smart shipping than right now, Minister. We're talking about the use of advanced technologies to ensure that we're doing the right things at the right time and utilizing very little of our resources to have optimal outcomes. Again, a number of things that we're interested in and we expect to come from the discussion, discussion surrounding reduced emissions, optimizing energy consumption, uh, issues to do with oil spill detection, and of course, I'm pretty sure the minister will mention something about decarbonization today. I feel like I'm being prophetic in that regard. And so, we're talking about smart shipping, we have to be certainly mindful of AI. Everyone has seen that artificial intelligence has occupied the discourse for the last year or so. Many of us are very afraid of it because we don't understand it. Today we hope to get a greater understanding about how we treat with some of these things while integrating them. Gender and the ocean. I will just say this about gender. I think for every discussion we have about development colleagues, unless we are having a discussion about how to properly integrate gender into that discourse, then we are doing ourselves a great disservice. I remember in series one, I was chastised by my colleagues for having a testosterone-dominated panel. And Ambassador <laughs> Gion Varsh was a part of that testosterone-driven um, team. So we decided it was not just uh, sufficient to have the, the panel constituted with a lot of females, but to have the substance of the discussion surrounding how we can have greater gender balance and contribution. And for those of us who don't know this, women bring a lot to the table. I mean, a lot of what they have brought to the table certainly is the diversity of perspectives, uh, a, cert a certain detail orientation that will help us to embark on greater clarity surrounding issues of increased capacity, uh, building and education. They'll talk about their own empowerment. They'll ensure that the, the, the right representation is at the table and of course, women assist a great deal with robust policies, and I just wanted to just share this. So we, we, we have a lot of challenges. We have not fully brought them to the table in the way that we should, but there are some very dynamic women who I have shared on the screen who are doing amazing things, two of whom are on the panel today, and other females who are doing fantastic things in the maritime and the marine space in our region. Moving forward, we have to embrace the technology. We certainly have to be more open to the integration of, of, of gendered conversations and gendered actions to, to, to drive uh, an environment of innovation and growth. And certainly we're working together ultimately for an inclusive and sustainable and inclusive maritime sector. And how did I do with my one minute, ladies and gentlemen? We set the context and we're ready to have a feast today. So without further ado, I want to take the next minute or so, and it's, it's, I, I, I can't cut this short because he has a very exciting bio. The danger, of course, that I've understood is that if the bio is too long, it forces the speech to be even longer because the speech can't be shorter than the bio, right, Minister? So I'll try to, to make it concise enough. So 
Honorable Minister Hervé Berville was born on the 15th of January, 1990. Yes, that's correct. He is a French economist and a member of the party of the President Emmanuel Macron. He has been serving as Secretary of State to the Prime Minister in charge of the sea since July 4th, 2022. From 2017 to 2022, he was an MP, member of the French National Assembly, representing the department of, I do, I've done so well up to this point. Uh, help me, Minister. The department of Côte d'Amour? Côte d'Amour. There you go. Uh, yeah, we have to take the degree away after that, right? And this is in Brittany. He was also a spokesperson for his party. The minister is a Tutsi survivor of the Rwandan genocide having been evacuated by French forces at the age of four and later adopted by a working class French couple in Brittany, France. An upbringing which would cement his passion for the sea. He graduated from the London School of Economics in 2016 with a Master of Science in Political Economy. During his studies, he conducted research and later became head of the Institute for Innovation at Stanford University in Nairobi, Kenya. He's a published author and is active in French intellectual circles. In the French National Assembly, Mr. Reville was a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. In addition to his committee assignments, he serves as vice chairman of the French Parliamentary Friendship Group for relations with Burundi and Rwanda. In April 2020, he was dispatched by President Emmanuel Macron to Kigali to officially represent the French government at the commemoration ceremonies to mark the 25th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't believe that deserves a rousing round of applause as we welcome Minister Braville to bring his remarks and to make his statements to us. Let's keep the applause going virtually and in the room. Woo! Okay, that's a way to warm people, to welcome people, sir. That's a way to welcome people uh, in a really warm uh, manner. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Um, are you ready to hear some more French? Yes, please. Yeah? <laughs> no. It, it will be my pleasure, but uh, I've been told by the ambassador no, I have please. to speak in, in, in English. One okay. line. One line? One line. Okay, one très bien. Bon, moi, je suis très 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 heureux d'être avec vous aujourd'hui et je voulais vraiment vous remercier du fond du cœur, euh, professeur, euh, cher professeur Spencer, pour à la fois l'accueil, pour également la qualité de ce que vous faites ici dans cette magnifique euh, université, la Caribbean Maritime University, et puis vous dire que c'est un plaisir d'être ici puisque c'est la première fois en plus de 30 ans qu'il y a un ministre français qui vient en Jamaïque. Et donc la dernière fois qu'il y a eu un ministre, je n'étais même pas né. All right. All right. Last time. <laughs> so I'm going to do it in English, only the last line. The last time that Jamaica had the chance to see a French minister, I was not even born. So for me, it's a real pleasure, a real honor to be here. So I'm not going to uh, uh, cite like uh, uh, um, all the, the people here, but just telling you, like, honestly, it's been, I arrived yesterday. I'm going to unfortunately leave uh, on Friday, but it's the first vid visit of many others. And I met with the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. Uh, we call each other already frère, brother, because we share a lot of things in common. We have the same passion also for education, for sports, for making sure that we increase cooperation between uh, France and Jamaica. And we have a chance, a unique chance right now, is that we have like a, just um, a magnificent ambassador, Ambassador Olivier Guillaume-Varche. You can uh, give him a round of applause. <laughs> and he's, he's really eager to make sure that there is more French visit here and that we foster uh, the, the cooperation. And you have a second chance, you know, like uh, why being limited to one? 
that we have uh, today also here, Eleanor Carroa, which is the Member of Parliament representing the French people in Latin America and Caribbean. I can, I can tell you she's really committed also to foster relationship between our two societies, our two countries, our two parliaments. So I, can, I think you can also give her a round of applause. Donc, merci beaucoup. Et um, c'est aussi, it's also an honor to be the second uh, keynote speaker. And I think our society, and in a time of, um, you know, like a, a social network, in a time of, you know, um, almost permanent and constant uh, information, we need to have this moment that we can kind of like exchange views, that we can have this kind of, I will try not to be too long, even if you already see that, uh, you know, I was elected member of parliament, so I like to speak. <laughs> but I will try to give you some space to have like some uh, uh, Q&A. But I, I, for me, it's really important. Every time I do uh, a, a visit, I try to, to, to have this kind of moment to listen to what you're saying and to see also what can inspire friends. And I'm here also because what you're doing in the Caribbean Maritime University is just like exceptional in, in terms of like excellence, in terms of innovation, in terms of technology. So that's why I took in my luggage also uh, the, the manager director of the Ecole Nationale Supérieure de la Marine Marchande. I'll leave you with the translation after. Our Maritime University. And he rightfully said like there is so much that we can inspire by the way you structure and the way you embrace also this maritime uh, destiny, even if, of course, France will remain, will remain, because we're going to do a lot of effort, one of the, the, the biggest uh, maritime country, but we want to make sure that we really increase the cooperation. So thank you very much uh, for hosting me. I'm here because, you know, in France, I fight, we fight every day to strengthen our maritime power. We do it for you also, uh, the young generation, to nurture and promote the sea. The training you have chosen is a path of excellence in a country steeped in maritime history, from the Pirates of the Caribbean at Port Royal, very close to here, to the Convention of the Law of the Sea, which is our constitution for the ocean. And it's combined also combined, sorry, the doctrines of two intellectuals, John Selden and Hugo Grotius. One advocated the appropriation of the sea by the nation, while the others defended the principle of freedom of use for all seafarers from every country. And the Montego Bay Convention taught us that although we feel free when we go to the sea, there is no freedom without responsibility, and there is responsibility for us, for you, the Nigerian, is to protect the ocean. So thanks to all of you for having embraced this noble vocation at such a prestigious university. You have made the right choice because, as you know better than I, the maritime sector will determine our future and 80% of our economy is based on the maritime space. And most of the industrialization of the last 15 years and in the next 15 years will go through uh, port. And that is why we need smart shipping. That is why we need infrastructure. That is why we need investment. And that is why we need women also because we cannot embrace our future in, by leaving 50% of the uh, population, especially if it's most of the time 50% of the brightest yes. part of the population. You. you represent this generation of awareness, knowledge, and immediacy, a generation who understand the importance of the seas and ocean to our daily lives, who understand their role for the sovereignty of states, and above all, we understand that one of the great challenges of our times, of our centuries, lie in the fight against climate change, which is threatening in these spaces and therefore the future of our planet. And I'm really deeply passionate about my job because it embraces two key uh, challenges. First of all, economic sovereignty. And you know better than I, the issue of sovereignty in the Caribbean space and in all across the, the world. And the second one is the fight against climate change and the loss of biodiversity. We cannot increase economic sovereignty. We cannot tackle climate change if we leave aside the issue of protecting the ocean, the issue of developing maritime uh, economy. The ocean, as you know better than I, they are the link between all the continents. They enable us to live, to travel, and to work. But first and foremost, they define the strategies 
of states. To strengthen our economic sovereignty, therefore, we must see the ocean as a strategic space to be protected, promoted, and also sometimes uh, uh, fight for because it's a key element of our strategic autonomy. The independence and self-sufficiency self self of states and depends on their ability to command the maritime sector. In particular, this required reinforcing merchant fleets. And indeed, because you know the world freight is the key element of our globalization, we need to strengthen, to foster also uh, the merchant fleet at the disposal of our nation, and it will increase uh, this uh, uh, sovereignty. But fundamentally, commanding the maritime sector to strengthen strategic sovereignty is also a way of preserving our seas and ocean. And it comes to my second, uh, uh, the second challenge is the one of the fight against climate change. Scientists all agree the ocean are the planet's principal carbon sink, absorbing 90% of the heat generated by human activities. There are the invisible clim climate regulating force, which for too long we thought capable of absorbing the excesses of our carbon emitting growth based on the belief that resources were infinite. To be honest, we have asked too much to our oceans. The increase in ocean temperature is now having a domino effect with the melting of the ice caps, the rising sea level, heat waves, ocean acidification and climate disasters. Today, nearly 700 million people live in coastal areas and nearly half of the world population relies on fishing to cover the need in protein. The fight against climate change and loss in biodiversity is therefore the emergency of the coming decade and the maritime sector and the people like you who are passionate about the maritime sector and the ocean are a key contributors to this fight. In this sense, the signal sent by the International Maritime Organization at the beginning of July about achieving zero greenhouse gas emission by 2050 is a, is a move in the right direction. France is a proactive force in this matter at the core of the civil society expectation in terms of sea protection. And we're gonna continue to make sure that at the European level, but also in the international uh, forum, at the international organization, we put ocean, we put maritime sectors at the key uh, 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 junction on, on those fight. And in France, the French president and the prime minister assigned me with three priorities. First of all, strengthen the protection of the ocean. Second of all, develop the maritime economy and also develop a, a really vibrant fish sector that can allow us to reinforce our uh, food sovereignty. And third uh, element, which is really key also in, in our fight also to, to, to be able to project our young people in, in really the, the, the key challenges in the next decade, is to make sure that we can have a maritime special planning because managing the coexistence of sea-based activities is a fundamental issue. Sea-based wind power is one response to the energy crisis, and we must determine zones for the installation of uh, sea park without, of course, threatening historical activity. And we need to make sure that we put in place this uh, maritime special planning to make sure that we do the right investment, that we give visibility, stability also to investors and to uh, the, the public sector and to the all the high civil uh, servant. And as you know, what we're observing in the world where successive geopolitical clashes make international consensus increasingly uncertain, fragile, and precarious, while we're observing this geopolitical context, we saw in the maritime sector, we saw uh, in the issue related to ocean and the sea that we've been able to move forward, to progress because of la sagesse of the seafarer. La sagesse, I don't know how you, the wisdom of the, of the seafarer. Uh, uh, and over the last few months, 
we've been able to achieve together the Commune Montreal Agreement to protect nature and restore damaged ecosystems, the famous COP15. At the United Nations Agreement, we've been able to protect the uh, deep sea mar mar marine sorry, biodiversity with the BBNG uh, Treaty, which represents you know, this, the high sea, 45% of the global surface. And more recently, we've been able to reach an agreement at the International Maritime Organization for a more ambitious strategy to reduce greenhouse gases emitted by maritime uh, sectors. I see those achievements as the first step toward going further and speeding up the international community engagement for maritime sector. I see those achievements as the proof that in the Caribbean area, in the Pacific Ocean, in the Indian Ocean, that you know that France is a really an oceanic nation because we have footprint, we have territories from Pacific with the Polynesia to Caribbean with the Martinique and Guadeloupe to Asian India with the Réunion. And because we're like able to really understand what's going on and the differences of, of course of approach in those uh, territories, we're really convinced that it's through uh, multilateralism, it's through regional cooperation, it's through bilateral cooperation that we'll be able to deal with all the uh, challenges. And our ambition, our ambition is to make sure that all those questions converge in 2025 in the United Nations Ocean Summit that will be held in Nice, in France, and you're all invited, of course. The weather is not as good as in Brittany, my region, but you see, it's still a beautiful place, and Nice. And we want to make sure that there is people from Jamaica, from the Caribbean, from the Pacific Island, because we need to put at the center of all our diplomatic also effort, of all our diplomatic uh, uh, debates, all the different culture in the countries and Jamaica is a really a country who has no need to prove that it's a soft power and it can uh, contribute a lot to the world and a lot uh, to uh, our common objective for the maritime uh, sector. So we intend with this conference uh, that we're hosting con in conjunction with the Costa Rica to maintain the dynamic of this past month so that in this conference we see a set of concrete decision and progress in favor of the ocean. And I'm here also in Jamaica, aside the fact that I'm really pleased to see Professor Spencer and your Secretary of State, because we're having really important discussion on deep sea mining. You know that here in Jamaica, you have the International Seabed Authority, and we have discussion in the Council, we have discussion at the General Assembly, really key to, s to know if we're gonna start this year or in the next few months uh, the deep sea mining, or if we give us a little bit time to make sure that we have enough evidence, enough science to make sure that we protect the marine environment. As you know, French President Emmanuel Macron at the COP27 in Sharm el in Egypt last year took a strong position. France will not, France won't uh, start and we will not do deep sea mining in this territory and is advocating also for a precautionary pause or moratorium. We're advocating for the fact that we need more science, more regulation, and a collective work uh, to better understand the consequences of the deep sea. So that's why I'm here. It's also to discuss, to listen to countries who are not sharing the same argument. But I think the discussion we had this morning uh, with also the Secretary General was really important to better move forward together because there is no other option. It's through collective action that we'll be able to ensure that UNCLOSE is uh, well, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, regarded and we put in place the different uh, um, obligation and at the same time that we protect the environment and that we protect the marine uh, ecosystem. So this position of France against deep sea mining is profoundly rooted in the interests of the humanity and the future uh, generation. I'm here also and I'm speaking with you because the, one of the key issues for the future of the maritime sectors lies in the huge challenge 
of developing a decarbonized maritime economy. And a decarbonized maritime economy, for me, is not just like a, a buzz or a keyword. It's the key element to accelerate, or at least to take back the, the, the beautiful idea of industrialization, of making sure that our economies are based also in industry. And it's through decarbonization that we'll be able to put in place, to invest in industries, to invest in plants. And when you look at the rise of populism, when you look at the, 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 the rise of dangerous rhetoric across the political spectrum, it's because sometimes our government, we say like, okay, industry, it's in other country, it's far from where we should consume, where we should uh, 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 buy our product. And I think industrialization also is a key element to make sure that there is a growing middle class and industrialization is a good thing for an economy because it creates job, good job, it gives the opportunity to people to rise uh, in the ladder of uh, the, um, the, their employment. So decarbonization is the key element of industrialization and decarbonization, of course, is the key element to fight climate change and, uh, of course, to give good job, job fitted for the, 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 the future uh, challenges. So I'm going to mention maybe three key, three, three, three key issues uh, uh, for uh, the maritime economy, which I think are the most important. First of all, the development of port. In terms of port, our priority should be threefold. First, the electrification and the greening of ports. The installation of K-side electrical outlet allows, allows sorry, vessel to, to cut CO2 emission by more than 85%. This is why we need to accelerate the installation of the main training port here, but uh, of course in Europe and all across uh, the uh, maritime country. Secondly, we need to develop the links between trading port and rail and river transport modes. The spinning off of model shift to accompany the decarbonization of freight transport on land. And we need to invest to make sure that uh, this model shift uh, from road transport to rail and river modes is part of the investment that we all gonna have to make over the next uh, 30 years. Thirdly, the capacity to equip our port to host industrial activity contributing to the decarbonization. Because the port has to be a place where we decarbonize, but it has to be also a place where we host industries that will foster the decarbonization of all the economy. Just as yesterday, sea and river sports were sites where EV industries, plants were established, refineries, petrochemical plants, steel industry, for the coming years, they will be, they have to be the ch choice location for the setting up of industrial ecosystem relating to new energy, hydrogen, sustainable fuel, and sea-based wind power. And we have here a challenge, because when it, it comes to alternative fuel, there is a huge battle, because you have the aviation, you have uh, the cars, you have also uh, other sectors. And the specificity, the characteristics of the maritime sector is that, that you have like different segments of, uh, of ships. You have the fishery ship, you have the transport uh, uh, vessel, you have, um, of course, the, the, um, the, the transport, the fish, the, the cruise, the one. And in each of these segments, there is so many different sides. So the capacity of uh, being quickly at the right scale in terms of competitiveness, in terms of financial returns, it's more complica complicated than in, uh, in the maritime transport. So that is why we need much more cooperation between countries than other uh, sectors. And that is why France uh, will implement this year a maritime investment fund to accelerate, not mainly with CMA CGM, but also with Total, uh, this uh, maritime decarbonization. Thank you very much. We'll discuss this maritime investment fund after yeah, also. <laughs> and the second priority is to reduce greenhouse gases generated by sea transport. And you talked about it uh, uh, before. As I mentioned earlier, the new strategy adopted last June at the International Maritime Organization paves the way to reduce 
greenhouse gases emitted by ships and set two clear targets. Reach zero greenhouse gas emission by 2050 with intermediate targets in 2030 and 2040. And second one, reach five to 10% of sustainable fuels in the energy mix of the fleet by 2030, which confronts us with the major issue of availability of this new fuel, biological and synthetic. And, and this new investment fund that we'll put in place that has to reach at least 1.5 billion uh, euros at the beginning, it will allow us also to give previsibility and to create green shipping corridor. Because there is no way that in France we'll uh, 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 put in place this kind of technology if in Jamaica, in Kingston, you're not using, if there is no the technology to make sure that it can goes back uh, to uh, uh, France with beautiful product from Jamaica. So that is why cooperation, green shipping corridors, is something uh, twins to the capacity of uh, 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 putting in place uh, sustainable fuels. These historic decisions have been taken in a remarkable spirit of cooperation and consensus, which clearly shows that multilateralism is in better shape than we are led to believe. We are committed with the European Union to continue this fight, and of course, we really welcome the work, the uh, tireless work of Jamaica to make sure also that we put in place a carbon pricing system based on the amount of green gas, gases emitted by vessel that will be a legally binding economic instrument. But we also op open to new ideas, and this is for you, young people. You have so many ideas in the next 10 years that you can put in place. We'll make sure that uh, Professor Spencer convey them to the right people, to the right minister. But we have to be open to new ideas because I don't really know what will be the sustainable fuel implemented in all the different vessels in 2050, to be honest. But I know that we have to put in place those kind of technology we have to start now by training, by investing, and by cooperating. And we need to be prepared to new ideas to leave our comfort zone, just as scientists and entrepreneurs are now doing in order to develop wind propelled solution formation vessel. We also have to develop the smart ship approach to take advantage of new technologies in the field of information, autom automation, artificial intelligence, automatization, robotic, to develop vessels and drone. And that goes back to the first point, but that will be the last one uh, of my uh, speech, the issue of training. You see, when I talk about automatization, robotics, artificial intelligence, smart shipping, system of the fuel, I'm already dépassé. I don't know how to say dépassé in French, uh, in English. I'm, uh, I'm od already updated. So it's you who will be able to put in place uh, those new technologies. They'll, they'll be able to foster innovation because uh, Professor Spencer is giving great speech, is leading this uh, uh, university, but it, we won't be the one uh, having those great ideas that will shape the world and that will shape the maritime uh, sector. So the issue of training is the, the challenge ahead of us and we need to attract new profiles with the talent and genius to turn the sectors green and who will become the ambassador also of ocean protection. The main levers are training and the appeal of the sector protection. With me, as I said, we have the, the managing director of the Ecole Nationale Supérieure Maritime and with the director of the Caribbean Maritime University, who I know share those priorities. We're gonna later sign a partnership agreement between your schools that will open up prospects for joint action between France and Jamaica. <laughs> it will open prospects for better and stronger cooperation between Europe also and the Caribbean. It will open new prospects and new action in cooperation between companies in Jamaica and companies in France. And it will, uh, I hope so, it will increase the investment of French companies in Jamaica, such as CMA, CGM, Vinci, and it will open also new investment from Jamaican uh, companies in France. If it can be in my constituency in Brittany, it will be even better, in the Bretagne, in Côte d'Armor, but it will open a new field, a new sea of opportunity. Some of you know the Mercian Navy from a very 
early age. Some were born on ships, grew up amid the feats of their parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, or friends. Some have contented themselves with learning about it in books. Others collect posters, postcards, or models. To all of those students in Jamaica, in France, one, the one watching also on YouTube, at the Caribbean Maritime University, at, at the NSM, whatever your memories and motivation are, I can tell you that you are the right place to change the world. I, I truly believe in the unprecedented power of the young generation to change the world. Studying gives us the potential to change things, to change one own destiny, but sometimes also to change that of others while respecting each other's choice. And it makes also us aware of the essential need to feminize sea-related sectors, sea-related <laughs> activities. We are all engaged and united in this struggle, but we need to do more, more, and more. And for this, as responsible seafarer, in France, we are starting at the ENSM, making sure that we update the, all the international rules and regulations to promote gender equality that we put in place an action plan to fight against difference in pays and career opportunities, to improve the balance between personal and professional life, that we appoint also a woman at the right place, at the right level, and also that we make sure that we have women in board of different companies of the maritime sector. So that's why, so that's why in uh, our interministerial inter work with the Prime Minister, I propose to her that one of the key pillars of our maritime strategy should be, should start by putting more women and feminizing uh, the sector. It's for me something that is not negotiable, that's something that will allow us to tackle the challenges. And, if, and just to be completely, uh, let's say, um, ambitious. There is no maritime ambition if, if there is no enough women in this sector. We'll uh, continue. We we'll need to work together. And that's one of the key priorities of uh, Francois Lambert of l'ENSM. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies and ladies, and then after gentlemen. Dear students, with the ocean as your horizon, you are about to experience one of the most fascinating and most demanding of all human and professional adventures. I wish you, of course, every one of you, the very best, a career worthy of your expectation and merits. Maritime navigation must embrace, and maritime sector must embrace the challenge of the time, gender equality, ecology, transparency, uh, of course, economic sovereignty. And with this in mind, I'm pretty sure that here in Jamaica, here in France, we'll be able to increase the smart shipping, be better on the gender balance, and increase the maritime environmental protection. So long live Jamaica, long live France, vive la République et vive la mer. Thank you again. Thank you again, Minister, for those insightful um, points that you raised. And thank you all for coming, of course. Uh, we are, I appreciate your being here. Now, there are several issues as it relates to the marine space, especially when you think about marine environmental protection. I just want to pick up two short points. Um, I don't want to keep us here too, too long. 
And I want to talk, I want to, talk to us about smart shipping and how technology can be used. How technology can be used to help us solve these problems. Now, in the shipping space, you know, there are certain issues that come about when you have a vessel on the seas. Now, we can talk about food waste and medical waste, and food waste is actually a wonderful opportunity to produce biofuel, which would, again, help us to, um, to provide more sustainable fuels. But I don't want to talk about food waste at this point. I want to talk about water, right? Now, for those of us who aren't aware, ballast water is one of those things that happen to be a, a solid part of the shipping landscape. Now, you might not know what a ballast is. I know all the shipping people here know what it is. But a ballast essentially is a space in the vessel where water is taken in to help stabilize the ship. And typically when you are unloading cargo, you would have an empty ballast. And when your cargo is offloaded, your ballast would be well, full or you'd have more water in there. Now, what, this, what does this mean now? Why am I talking so much about water? As we know, ships don't typically stay in, in one port, in one section of the country, in one section of the world. So we have a, a bit of an issue when we think about the fact that a ship is coming from port A, it's taking on water, going to port B, which may be halfway around the world, and that water now has to be removed in order for the cargo to come on board. However, we're offloading water into another ecosystem, another marine environment, which might cause a few issues. And we've seen that happening. Now, there are treatment systems and there are ways in which we can address that. However, I think smart technology can actually help to do more detection, do more sampling of the water in a more effective way. So the ship engineers and the ship men don't have to think about going to sample it themselves. Is it working? Is everything, you know, cohesive? Are we having leaks or anything like that? We can use smart technology. We can use artificial intelligence. We can use other sampling techniques in order to effect that efficiently. In addition to that, you know, we have bilge water which is another contaminant, a more chemical industrial contaminant. However, we can use biotechnology and bioremediation to make these innovations to find a way to process this water so that when we go to offload it, it is in a more sustainable, a more eco-friendly format than, when, than it would have been had we not treated it. So those are a few ways I think that smart technology can be used to help the shipping industry itself. Although I'm not the gender expert, I will give some comments on um, the gender balance. I think there is no, no one here will dispute the fact that we have a gender imbalance when it, when it comes to our marine, se our marine sector, especially fisheries, when you think about that. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I watch TV, whenever we see the fisher folk, it's always a man. Very rarely we see maybe a, a female somewhere, um, and you know, unfortunately, it, it is what it is. However, I think that this is also a cultural and societal issue. We think that this is not women's work, this is work for men, etc., etc. However, I think we, as females, need to move out that space, right? So I'm not telling everyone to pack up and go on the boat and, you know, lay some fish pots. I'm not saying that. But there are other ways you can incorporate yourself in the marine sector. We know that there are not a lot of seafarers, and you'll see the statistics. Consider coming to the Caribbean Maritime University and doing seafaring. <laughs> Consider coming to the Caribbean Maritime University and doing artificial intelligence and help to develop the wonderful technologies that I mentioned a while ago in terms of detecting. Come to the Maritime University and do marine biotechnology so we can develop that wonderful enzyme, can develop that wonderful enzyme concoction and technology to create more effective biofuels, to create 
ways to decontaminate that bilge water so that when we offload it or if there's a leak, we're not um, anxious. We know that, well, the water is fairly well decontaminated. We're not, it, we're not giving any imposition to these port, society, to these port um, sectors. I also, want to, I also want to speak about the other ways that women can integrate themselves. So I, spoke about, so I spoke about artificial intelligence, and I spoke about how we can in, improve our, our space in terms of the number of seafarers. I think there are also other ways. Manufacturing, you know, a lot of women are in the processing of, of, um, of, of fish. So how about not just the cleaning, not just the, the um, distribution of fish, we can look into manufacturing, we can look into aquaculture, which I think is gonna be the next big thing. So I, I end my comments there, and thank you so much. director of graduates, or the graduate coordinator, <laughs> sorry, at the Institute of Gender and Development at the University of Western. Minister, <laughs> and to our French contingent, that's it for my <laughs> French. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to uh, greet all our very distinguished guests, students, panelists, fellow panelists, and of course, our president, Professor Spencer. Uh, so a lot has been said, and I'm sure a lot more will be said in our Q&A. Um, but I really just wanted to, before making brief comments, um, thank the minister very much for his comments, uh, two, two comments that he made. One on transnational cooperation. Uh, minister, we have a phrase in Patwa that said, one hand can't clap, one hand cannot clap meaning that there has to be cooperation, there has to be um, synergy. Um, and not only, you mentioned transnational, international synergy, but it's very critical for gender as well. Um, when we think of gender, we automatically think women, and that's important, of course. But uh, gender is more than a woman issue. Gender is understanding society's expectations, roles, um, everything that we put on these bodies that are male and female. And we can't do all the wonderful things that the minister has said if we are not harnessing the power of these bodies, of these expectations, these training, all of these things that go into, into that process. And also that the minister said that we, of course, cannot exclude 50%, maybe 51%, of the world's population. He did say the brightest. I will leave that with him. I don't think I'll agree there. But really, it's very important to have these conversations to bring these and other issues to the fore. Um, so my brief comments have to do with this issue of SMART. Now, I have been on a total of zero ships in my life. So I am not here as a shipping expert, but as a gender and development expert. And in thinking about this forum and this conversation, smart, when we think of something being smart, we tend to think of, of it as connecting to the internet, technology, automation. But a very important part of being smart is reaction to events, right? What will happen in that ship, in that vessel, if there is an issue? Can the automation react to that event or signal to someone that there is something going wrong? So I just wanted to use this um, acronym SMART to speak about some of the ways in which we can fuse all of these ideas of technology, smart shipping, gender, and marine, um, the en marine environment. S, the first thing I would think of is stopping any form of discrimination in the industry. This may mean violence against women or sexual harassment on vessels, on board ships, 
um, when you speak to women in the industry, many complain of the ship being a lonely space for women because of the male-dominated nature of the space. M, for maintaining balanced lives. I think one of the major things that smart shipping will do is helping in automation. And what does that mean? What will that mean for people, not just women, who may, who may not necessarily want to spend months away at sea, away from their families. Men have families too, right? And we have to move away from this view that only women have responsibility for family. So maintenance of balanced lives can come through smart shipping if we have more automation and less dependence on this long stretch away at the sea. A, access to educational opportunities, which the minister spoke about. So not only education towards doing the same thing over and over, but importantly, as he said, education towards innovation. Innovation is going to take us forward, and innovation needs all hands on board. Now, I'm not from the CMU, so I will not say necessarily come here, although I'm very happy to be here. We'll, you'll, you'll, you'll edit that out. Um, there are other universities that you can go to for that. Um, but honestly, I mean, CMU has been doing a fantastic job. I just have to pause to say, will I, will I, will I? <laughs> Let me tell you why the job is fantastic. We have an issue in education in the region where our men and boys are not interested in tertiary education. Yet, at the CMU, it is one of the few that actually has a slight um, positive, I guess, in balance where men are concerned. As men, we make up about 51% of the students here. But also, that means 49% are women. In this area that is so male dominated. I think those are wonderful statistics. All right. So many, many congrats. Um, the last two are raising awareness about current, the current work being done. I'm so happy that the minister spoke about the positives. There are so many, you know, the, the um, associations that are here, WEMAC, WISTA, there's a lot of work that's actually happening. But do we know about this type of work? You know, we actually have to use forums like this to spread the word and raise further awareness about what is happening in the industry. And the last thing is T. I did spell smart, if you missed that. Um, tech for equality. We do have to be careful that in focusing on technology, we don't miss the fact that technology can be discriminatory, can be racist, can be sexist, it can be the opposite of inclusive. And certainly we want that smart shipping, gender equality, and marine, the marine environment benefit from an equal look at technology and not one that is discriminatory. Thank you very much. <laughs> here on our panel at this time. Lots of exciting things. We're talking, we're going, we're engaging. And what I want to pose to you, what did the A stand for in the acronym? Online, type it in the chat because I feel like you are paying more attention than those in the audience. Anyone? What did the A stand for? Access. There you have it. So at this time, we're going to invite our final panelist. She is Dr. Yvette Smith-Johnson, and she is the Director of Graduate Studies here at the Caribbean Maritime University. Please make her welcome. Bonjour tout le monde. Thank you so much, Donique, and thank you, Minister, for your very just challenging presentation because it challenges us to think about the best things that we bring to the table. And one of the things we didn't bring this evening is song. No, I don't really sing. But if you remember, under the sea, yes. life is better down where it's sweater under the sea. So you know where I'm going. Now, one of the challenges that The Little Mermaid had, and I'm sure that some of us are going to see the new movie shortly, because you have children who you have to take to see it, is that she fell in love with a guy from above. And Sebastian, which is Jamaican self-mourn, was telling her to stay under the sea. 
Well, we ladies don't subscribe to that anymore. We go where we want to go. We fall in love with who we want to fall in love with. And it's a different world. Sorry, Sebastian. So let's see what the next installment is going to bring. What Danit did not say this evening is that I am also the Vice President of Women and Development for the Women in Maritime Association of the Caribbean. Good to see you, Ambassador Gardner. We just had good discussions in Antigua. And one of the things, Minister, that we are happy for is that the decision-making spaces of this globe see where the deficits are. And so the International Maritime Organization under the auspices of the United Nations mandated that goal five of the sustainable development goals would be supported with action and policy and uh, advocacy. Goal five demands the equality issue. And I'm so happy that Dr. Bean just brought something clear to the table because equality is sometimes equity. It's never dominance. And it's never I must do everything that you do. But it is I can, I should be able to do it if I want to do it. And that is what IMO knew when it says that in the de developing spaces where countries are emerge, have emerging economies, they would support the Women in Maritime Association. And so we have eight women across the globe. You'll hear them sp spoken of differently. Where the WEMA, Women in Maritime Association, occurs in the Arab world, they call themselves AWIMA. Yeah, it sounds, AWIMA, yeah, all right. And if it is in the Pacific, Minister spoke about the Pacific region, then you'll hear about PAC WIMA. And so you'll hear the different shades. When it's in the Spanish spaces, Ambassador, they call themselves some Spanish derivative that comes out as a red mambla, and we're like, okay. But in the Caribbean, we are the Women in Maritime Association of the Caribbean. We were the fifth WEMA to be launched. And so we are just, in 2015, we are, we're, we're just walking. But amongst the things that we see important is the representation and visibility of the women in the sector. And so across spaces like Martinique and Guadeloupe, which are French, Fran um, francophone countries, we are having the same call that we have in Jamaica. We want to see spaces where women are, women in shipping are mentored and coached and given a space to hold up their heads in the spaces that they are. And so amongst the things that we are doing in WEMAC is we are launching a plan to educate the maritime conscience amongst countries and amongst women in particular. And we are trying to set strategic goals to incubate the maritime conscience. Because as, as, a, as island states, one past director used to say, we walk with our backs to the sea. And amongst the things that we are doing in the Caribbean Maritime University under the leadership of Professor Spencer and his executive team is that we will be the first maritime education and training institution in the Caribbean to launch a student chapter of the Women in Maritime Association. We are launching that chapter come September in Maritime Awareness Week at our industry conference because we want policymakers and industry players to put their money where their mouth is. We want to see policymakers saying, you know, from France, a developed country, we are going to help the region, but we are stipulating by policy that there is representation because the ratio must be one to one for every scholarship, for every opportunity for growth. One woman, one man. And then when we sort out the gender issues, we will deal with that, right? But for now, we want to see a good ratio where the women are there as often and as frequently as a man gets an opportunity. Also, we want to ask the sector, CMA, CGM, 
for spaces for coaching and mentoring and for them to take our students as stakeholders in our curriculum because we are creating the workforce. So you must tell us who you want. And one of the best ways to do it is to send me a young woman and let her shadow somebody down here so she understands. So for us in CMU and through WEMAC, we want to work on representation and visibility. And we thank you, Ambassador, for sending more opportunities for that. And we are very excited about what we can do, not just under the sea, you know, down where it's wetter, but also on this side of operations. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. You can hear the passion about this kind of Thing. So, as I said before, we have the right people on this panel. And now it's your turn. We are just about ready to have our question and answer segment. So, I know that we've said a lot, and you have burning questions that you want to share with us. So, there will be a microphone in hand. What I'm going to ask you to do is walk, not in front of the cameras, because we want to see you the lovely panelists, but walk and ask your question. You can pose them to anyone, any member of the panel. You can also pose it to the minister. Um, and we'll start with one of our students. Wow. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Davia. Um, I can say it's a pleasure to be here today as someone who want, who plans to be a part of the maritime industry. It's really an honor to be here today to hear your thoughts and hopefully something that can help me in the future. My question, all right. To add, actually, Dr. Beam would have touched on it a little bit, but um, as we know, smart shipping as a, is, um, as a phenomenon focuses on creating an optimized, clean, and efficient environment for shipping through the use of artificial intelli intelligence. So there are, there are some clear implications for human element not required in the shipping industry. My question to the panel is, how can synergy be achieved between issues of employment and technological advancement in the maritime space? All right, Dr. Bian, you want to take that one? But that's the response that you have to give us in your testing, right? <laughs> uh, we'll take you three years. No. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 first of all, it's a real impression, as always. Second of all, I'm really happy to see that there is uh, so many women here in this, uh, in this room. And I have the chance also uh, in my ministry, you know, every year I have a high, a high civil servant like um, a cohort. And this year, the civil servant cohort of the uh, maritime affairs, they were like 90% women. And you know, in France, when you're part of the, 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 the maritime uh, uh, um, uh, high civil servant corp, you can go on the Champs Elysees and do the 14th of July defile, you know, with all the armed force. And for the first time, for the first time, the TV recognized the maritime affairs high civil servant because they were 90% women. So they were really intrigued by the fact that, oh, wait, when you talk about, when you think about uh, 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 maritime sector, you think about men, you think about like living for 15 years when you're a fishery sector, for not be two months when you're like a, 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 a transport uh, uh, sector. but. You have here right now in Champs Elysees, uh, being with all the armed force, like 90% of the court were women. And it was to also, it was really like an important moment for us and for all the maritime community because it shows that things are, are changing. You're not under the sea uh, anymore, but we need to make sure that when you emerge from the sea, you set stay uh, at the surface and even uh, higher. And just to uh, answer your, your, your question, if I can, in, one than, in less than one uh, minute, because I don't want to do man spreading in, on, on the floor, um, I think it's not something that we can or we have necessarily to oppose. I think uh, sometimes like technology can, use, can be used and is really helpful 
uh, to give more time for people, for humans, to do much more interesting things. And to be able, for example, uh, when we talk about like a, a maritime pollution, when we talk about transport, when we talk about fisheries, to focus much more on qualitative, uh, um, uh, qualitative work, qualitative job. So I don't really see like necessarily an opposition. We have to look sector by sector. We have to look, of course, like uh, uh, countries by countries. But I think we should not like um, um, uh, prevent the adoption of the technology because it's a threat. It's a potential threat for employment. Otherwise, we won't be having like a, a TV, a smartphone, or a, a machine uh, to help us in the kitchen, or help us in, 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 the, in the bathroom, or to, to clean the clothes, or, or all the stuff like this. To be, I'm not saying this because it's, uh, we're talking about women. <laughs> Just to be clear, no, no, because I'm not saying this. No, no, I'm talking generally speaking. So uh, technology, it's uh, also a way of tackling, uh, accelerating the way we can tackle challenges uh, together. And um, I'm deeply convinced also that, uh, as you said, we need to make sure when we regulate and when we uh, uh, integrate technology that they're not discriminatory. And I think this is a new horizon for us because we're not seeing this, but most of the times uh, when you look at adoption of technology, it's first of all the men who, who are the first uh, in the line. And most of the time, you remove women from position uh, they, they could have uh, also, I think it's really important. It's a new approach, it's a new policy, but we're going to continue doing this. And if I may say something to conclude, the T of smart can be, if I'm right, it can be Talawa. <laughs> Tackle but Talawa. And I think it can be also the, the, the Lickle but Talawa. And I think like the, the space for women right now in the maritime space is Lickle. But Talawa, and we're going to make sure that they increase because we need you, and it's going to be the only place to tackle the issue. If I could give you an example, though, before you move. Manzanilla International Terminal in Panama is one of the largest on this side of the world. And traditionally, men did the gate operations, meet the big trucks and get in those pallets and check. But because of technology, they have a room with you know, wall-to-wall -wall TVs, and technology is doing all the scanning and such. And most of the women working in what they told us was the NASA pro. They said, this is the NASA. Most of the people working there doing gate ops. And um, Ambassador Gardner is here, so he knows the board. Are women because of technology. So technology is a friend to women, because it does the heavy lifting exactly. and allows us to use We're smart. the smarts. Yep. So we're going to take our... What you're saying, I just believe that we have to find a way to balance it so we can enjoy the best of both worlds. Awesome. awesome. Thank, you. And thank you for your question. We have another student question, which is very, very tricky. Um, sir, um, you can sit. I would just like to pose a question to you. Louder. I would just like to pose a question to you. You can sit, though. Um, okay, so how will the gender equality and smart shipping work together to protect the marine environment? How can gender equality and smart shipping work together to protect the maritime environment? Okay, how can okay, uh, gender equality and smart shipping can work together? That's. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think they can, it's not like how they can, it's like they have to work together. There will be no smart shipping if we leave behind 50% of the population. And I'm not saying this because it's just like a, a, a motto. First of all, because in my family, like it's a power to the woman. So uh, my mother, my grandmother, my two sisters, my three sisters, but I still have one like uh, in Rwanda. This is the, the, the only way, there is no alternative. Sometimes we use this for, you know, uh, economics and, and financial like issue, but there is no alternative than having more uh, women. And gender equality, as you said, has to start from the design of the ship, and you need on this to really um, uh, 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 be inspired by um, the, the naval industry, the, um, sorry, the defense industry. Because in the defense industry, you have much more women on board than uh, in, 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 in the civil uh, uh, industry. So they, they manage a way to make sure that there is space, there is a way of uh, living, working, that will integrate 
people who enter the armed force and who want to, to be on, uh, on, on the boat. So for me, we have to start by saying, OK, it's not possible to not uh, integrate 50% of the population. So let's work on every single field, every single segment. And that's what we're doing right now in France. I have a, 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 a group called the, the Women of the Maritime Sector. I meet with them every three months. We do like a, a big meeting for two to three hours and we go field by field, region by region, because sometimes it's not exactly the same, and we try to tackle all the issues at the same time with different also approach, with financing, with training, with advocating sometimes, uh, with name and shame sometimes with some uh, company, because it's really important, and that's where we're gonna make sure that there is gender balance and a smart uh, a shipping, because there will be no real smart shipping without you and without a young girl. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much for that question and for your response, Minister. We have another student question. Yes. Oh, sure. Uh, she's, she's working. But just generally, um, it's very interesting that we you know, speak about education and innovation, but women already have the knowledge. Exactly. You know, women are water managers globally. Women are the ones who are um, forefront in um, resource management, water management, finding water. And so, so the relationship between women and water is, very, is already very endemic. Um, and as we have heard, there's so, because of technology and so on, there's so many more opportunities for not only women, persons with disabilities, the, re the list continues. It's about creating a more inclusive space so we can get the best persons, regardless of these things that would normally act as discriminatory uh, factors, into the space for the future and, and, and for making it better. But as I'm saying, these persons already have the knowledge. The knowledge is there. It's really just to harness it and to you know, make it more innovative for the current um, environment. Indeed. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. So my question is, what are some of the barriers or challenges that women face when pursuing careers in the marine sector? And how can these obstacles be overcome to promote greater gender balance? Professor. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I would have thought that the, the gender is the room. The the one or, we want you to own it. You own it. <laughs> uh, but, but certainly, I mean, well, I'll start with a positive. Uh, so, it's not lost on me that the Caribbean Maritime University sees of what needs to happen. And so we see an emergence now. So when Doc spoke earlier about 49% of our student population being women, even though we're a highly technical, tactile space, that sends a signal because we're talking about other institutions with 20% male, 80% female. Uh, there was a lot of uh, noise in the periodicals lately about that. So I think the challenge has always been, how do we frame the space in a way that it's smart enough, that's intuitive enough, that it is taking into consideration the nuances, the idiosyncrasies surrounding women in the workspace, that it is considering promotion practices, certainly, that are merit-based, a meritocratic system as opposed to one that's based on the fact that we assume that someone can carry a particular load. I use load loosely here, better than another. And so I think if we, if we continue to break through, some of these barriers and these challenges will disappear. I'll give you one anecdote which I think is powerful. Antigua, Ambassador Gardner, first marine pilot, yeah? female is a graduate from CME. Yes? And we had the pleasure of seeing her do her work and I mean her, her agility in jumping up on the side of the, of the vessel and doing what she was doing. There was nothing, I mean, in fact she seemed a little bit more nimble than the other guy I saw doing it. So I, I, I could be long winded but I just want to say that the, the challenges are similar to the challenges in other spaces. Some of our colleagues would have spoken earlier however to the uniqueness of maritime work if you choose a particular profession but these are not insurmountable by any by any shot thank you for your answer for that um do we have any other questions all right can we have the microphone Hi everyone so my name is Eleanor Kehua I'm here with the minister really glad to be uh, part of this delegation as a member of the French Parliament representing French people living here in Jamaica and throughout the Caribbean and Latin America. 
And I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for this very interesting discussion. And perhaps just give one, one thought, one final thought, which is we need international cooperation if we want to tackle these issues. And the fact that we have a Secretary of State, a minister from France here, discussing these very issues with you, I think is telling as to where we stand, France, in these regards. So feminism has been the cause of the first five years of President Macron, and it's the, the, the cause of this next uh, five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are also uh, taking the lead in um, Generation Equality Forum with Mexico. And I think there's so much we can learn from you, from Jamaica, from what you're doing here in this, in this university and throughout the country. So I just wanted to thank everyone for this opportunity to be yeah. here and tell you that we're more than happy to cooperate. And I hope many of you will go to France and um, show us what you're learning here and with this international exchange, improve our position as women in the maritime world, but also in general. So thank you so yeah. much. And we look Cheers. forward to the partnership here. We do. Cheers. All right. If I might, just yeah. quickly, I don't know how many people know, but this is, a, this is our French Connection Week. <laughs> <laughs> because here we have the French Minister of the Seas today. We have the director of ENSM about to sign a wonderful, powerful partnership with us. And on Friday of this week, we're signing an MOU with Kingston Freeport Terminal Limited, mm -hmm. another French connection. Exactly. So, so, so this is a week of tangibilizing what has always been a strong relationship, and I wanted to really applaud um, His Excellency Ambassador Grunberg. You've been a champion for CMU, and, and we, we continue to be grateful for that. Great. Awesome. So we have another question from another student. Good day. Yes. Okay. All right. So I have a simple question. How does gender equality in marine environmental protection impact decision making and overall governance in this sector? Mm, impact. Impact what? Decision making. Decision making. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, was, I, was, I was thinking that the, the, the esteemed minister would speak to that. Uh, no. Oh, no? Me? Okay. Well, All right, I'm not. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I'm by no means a, a politician. Um, however, I do believe that women are at the place in terms of, you know, education. Um, the first education we get is in the home. Um, so as mothers, as teachers, we have a large contingent of female teachers. I think women are really at that space to really educate and to really do the decision making in the informal, in the societal sector. Now, as the wonderful democratic um, country that we have and in our society itself, um, the decision makers should really be influencing the policy, right? We have a, lo uh, a cadre of NGOs, um, which a lot of them are actually led by females, <laughs> um, which put pressure on, on the government um, to really see what the issues are. So in that regard, I do think that women are actually pushing to get the policies, get the um, the particular issues that we want to be seen at the forefront in terms of the marine environment and how it can impact, impact future generations. So I do see a lot of young people, I must admit a lot of females really going out and trying to impact the environment in terms of you know, doing beach cleanups, advocating for better marine protection and you know, things like that. So there are different, that in, in my Thoughts. Maybe not at the political, you know, higher level, I can't speak to that, but um, certainly at a grassroots level, I, I see women really pushing forward uh, marine protection in that regard. And if, if I can add to it, um, well, Dr. Lena alluded, as one half of the problem, women have to be the one half of the solution. Mm -hmm. And then there are, um, speaking to NGOs, the International Maritime Organization, for example, 
has several groupings that are sponsored that deals with marine environment protection. This year, um, the theme for Maritime Awareness Week is MARPOL at 50. The commitment continues. And MARPOL is the, the whole um, legis legislation, for want of the best term, for against marine pollution. And then there are other little pockets that are powerful. There is a Glow Litter um, initiative to clean up global litter, Glow Fouling against global fouling. And then there are other initiatives coming out of that space that know that if we're going to be sustainable, we all have to join hands and get into these pockets of work. And right here in CMU, um, Professor will tell you that we have one of our senior lecturers who is the energy and brain behind an initiative to clean up. It's called Earth Ambassadors. So if you've ever met Dr. Um, Clayton, that's what she does in our downtime. And it's a powerful movement to clean up our environmental space. And support from it comes from NGOs and indeed political spaces because it looks good. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. So yes. we are one yes. half of the problem, we are one half yeah. of the solution. Um, and if I can zone in on your question, I'll really briefly. I've always felt that mental acuity and sharpness knows no gender boundary. You know. The smartest mind and the most appropriate talent must be at the table. The problem has been that we've ha had so much imbalance in keeping some of the smartest female minds out of the room. That there has been, and maybe rightly so, an overcorrection and a bit of imbalance in trying to make sure that we right the ship. But fundamentally what ought to happen is what Dr. Uh, Johnson, Smith Johnson mentioned earlier. If there is equity, it means that all of us have equal access to do the things that we want to do, the things that we can do, the things we do best. And if we do that, the best decisions will be made. You talk about policy, the best policy decisions will be made. If I can just like complete what exactly he said, because I, I, I was about to say a little bit the, the same thing. If there is no gender equality in an institution or in a sector, let's say 10% of women, 90% of, of, uh, of men. That means that the system by itself, structurally, is broken. So you can't have the best decision yeah. if there is only 10% of women on the table. Just that's a basic mathematical and logical stuff. Because it means that in the way you recruit people, in the way you attract talents, you're just like blind on one, one hive. So I, I'll give you an example. I was doing the negotiation in New York last year uh, of BBNJ, Biodiversity by a National Jurisdiction, the one who has to regulate, it's a United Nations uh, treaty regulating 50% um, uh, of, the, of the ocean. In New York, uh, one year ago, um, uh, I was in a room, I would say what, like 70% men, 30% women. Well, we failed to, to reach an agreement. I'm not saying we failed because there were uh, too much men. But what I realized when we reached an agreement uh, in March, it was like the president was a woman. Then the, most of the head of the delegation were women, or at least were like more than 50 uh, percent. Yeah. And it's just like a question of so also of um, when you're on the table and you bring those experiences, the, the, the woman that had to deal with uh, different issues, different way of seeing the world, because they had to deal with sometimes discrimination, sometimes with like a, uh, when you have to, when you have two or three kids, you don't do the negotiation the same thing. When you have to, 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 to get your kid to, to feed him, it means that you, for example, you finish the discussion not at uh, 1 p.m. with the a whiskey or something like this, because you have to take care also of the child. And I'm saying this, it's not like something caricatural, but it's something real. So it changed the way also how you negotiate, because you're not only between a man, and it brings just something which is for me normal, equity, and the right place uh, uh, of the woman at the table of negotiation, which leads to the best decision, to the better governance, and to a better protection of our return. <laughs> I don't think so, but just to add to what I used to say, um, countries that have greater participation of women in policy making and um, government decisions 
do wonderfully in terms of climate change. So that should tell us something. That's what, that's what the research shows, right? So I'll just put that icing on this, this, one, this not so simple answer <laughs> <laughs> that was given. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So we have time for one final question. One final question. Make it as brief as possible. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I must say congratulations, of course, to the Caribbean Maritime University for putting on this Port Royal lecture series. Very, very informative and an issue that we must address. So it is one that is at our forefront. And I'm very happy, Minister, that you touched on the issue of children. Because when you said that, what came to my mind is addressing smart shipping and gender equality without looking at our role as women in the home. And now we're having smart homes with technology almost becoming parents. How do we step back and address that issue while we move forward with addressing gender equality and smart shipping? I'll leave that one to the genders. I that one to the generous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I got my first kid six months ago, so I'm not experiencing <laughs> 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 um, Yes, I, th I think that's a really important challenge. Um, and I, I touched on it when I was speaking about maintaining balanced lives. Uh, that smart shipping will allow for more um, autonomous shipping options, which means people don't necessarily have to be physically present for the time that we have been accustomed to traditionally. Uh, and that will give persons more time in the home. And you know, we do tend to think of women as the primary caregivers culturally. But certainly, I think we have been moving toward globally. We're moving towards paternity leave and a greater appreciation for the roles that fathers play. So I think this is a gendered issue, not necessarily a woman's issue, um, where the um, advent of, well, not advent, but the, the continuation and the development of smart shipping will allow for better family balance and care for children eventually. Um, the issue of uh, technology raising children is, uh, I, th I think, a little out of the remit. Uh, for, for, for this panel, but it's certainly something that's important. But I, I think the focus really should be how can we harness um, technology to ensure that we do the work that humans need to do, right? Uh, and that, that won't ever change, right? Certainly technology, as Minister said, is here to assist. It's not here to take over despite what we may see coming. Um, but it's certainly here to assist us to be better people rather than taking over important jobs that we should have. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and on that note, I want to thank our panelists for joining today and for sharing your thoughts and for answering the questions. I hope that if you do have any other questions, please feel free to share them with us and we'll try to get them answered. If you are online and you shared your question, I promise we'll get them and we'll also respond. So at this time, we're gonna go into signing or a very illustrious <laughs> MOU. Uh, but before we do that, we know that we have CMU students from all across the world. And so we prepared just a special video for them. And so we're gonna look at that. Take a look. <laughs> 365 beaches, one for every day of the year. Antigua, Barbuda, Wadane, Yabuka. Known for our sun, sand, and sea, the Bahamas. <laughs> Known for its diverse cultures and beautiful beaches, Belize. Known for the Great War, China. Home of the most colorful city in the world, Curacao. Known for salsa music, antique cars, and it's from Cuba. <laughs> Land of life, birds, and human civilization. Guyana. 
the location of the European Space Center, French Galera. Home of Bollywood, Taj Mahal, India. Be her, my life. The creative capital of the Caribbean, a global gem, the home of friend setters, authors of history and legends, Jamaica. Montreux volcano and its rich Irish heritage, the British Oasis territory, Monta. Africa's largest producing oil nation, Goma, Boy and Whiskey, Nigeria. Known for having one of the most beautiful places in the world, Machu Picchu, Peru. The Royal Soka Kingdom and home of the steel pond, Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. And of course, we know that we are diverse, we're cultural, we're big, we're CMU, all right? So at this time, we're gonna just jump right into our MOU. And before we do that, I just wanna say that a big thank you to those who have joined us here and have joined us online. After we have done our, our MOU signing, we want to take a nice group photo. So stay back for that photo, and then we will go into our campus store. So, witness or MOU signing. And um, just to say that this signing is a, a major move towards educational partnerships, student exchanges, faculty exchanges, joint consultancies and the like. It's a very broad MOU and we're happy to be able to sign with you today. We're also, uh, Mr. Lombert, going to be handing two copies of our journal, uh, World Hospitality and uh, Tourism Themes a volume which was done by the CMU uh, uh, with the editor being our deputy president. So today is an exciting day and we'd like to have you say a few words and you go ahead with the signing. Thank you, President uh, Spencer. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, hello to my colleagues who stayed in France and helped us to, to prepare this, uh, this document, uh, Gerson particularly. And uh, I just say a few words to the students because I, I like to talk with them in France. Uh, and uh, I wish I could be your age, uh, <laughs> facing all those challenges uh, our uh, inspiring pa panelists, and particularly the minister, were pointing out. Uh, you, you are very lucky. Decarbonization, digitalization, gender uh, issues, uh, the, the management also. You have, uh, you have a great future that's waiting for you, so don't wait for it, and uh, move forward with uh, all the energy you are, you are giving in this school. It's a, a great pleasure to be here, and thank you also to, to the minister, yes. to our member of parliament, and to our wonderful ambassador who allows us, uh, Andrew, to, yes. to meet yes. and uh, to imagine many, many things. So it's the beginning of something uh, strong that Absolutely. we are building. Thank you. Indeed. Go ahead and sign on. So, it's two copies. Yeah. Let me sign this one. And then. All right. What an exciting discussion we have had this afternoon. I don't know about you, but I feel very empowered as a woman. I mean, of course I was empowered before, but being somebody as Dr. Bean, who is not so in the marine space, I feel very empowered to be a part of it, not just looking from it 
looking at it from the outside, but to actually being a part of things that will enhance the space and make it more gender friendly, I want to say, or women friendly, right? All right. So once again, I really, really want to thank you for joining us this afternoon at the Port Royal Lecture Series. It was my pleasure being, being with you. And for those online, thank you for sticking around with us. I know that sometimes online can be a little challenging, but we want to thank you for your time and your patience with us this, with us this afternoon. Also, thank you to our VPs, our senior management team, for always supporting the initiatives here at the Caribbean Maritime University. And so on behalf of our president, vice president, senior management, thank you.